From The Conversation, this is Don't Call Me Resilient. I'm Vinita Srivastava. I think it's important to think about the South Asian diaspora as being energetic, complex, multilingual, multi-regional, and multi-generational. And I think that's the most exciting thing for me right now. I look around and I see a lot of people who are invested in thinking about how do we end inequality. And Modi represents the worst avatar of inequality that we have. And I think people care about that. Later this month, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be making his first official state visit to the United States. And if his visits to Australia last month, to Canada in 2015, and to Texas in 2019 are any indication, he'll be given a rock star welcome. Millions around the world in different time zones are with us today. They are witnessing history in the making. U.S. President Joe Biden has already joked that he wants Modi's autograph because so many people want to see him while he's in the United States. Of course, Modi has his critics too, who point to the populist leader's far-right policies and human rights abuses. Still, Modi, leader of the world's largest democracy, remains one of the world's most popular leaders, not just at home, but among the tens of millions who make up the global South Asian diaspora. Today, we're asking just how important that diaspora is, just how much overseas support is contributing to Modi's popularity and success, and what kind of an impact could a progressive element of that diaspora have on Indian politics? I'm excited to have Anjali Arandekar today on the pod to help us sift through all of this. She is a professor of feminist studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and she is also the founding co-director of the University Center for South Asian Studies. Great to have you here, Anjali, today. Jai Bheem, Salam, and Namaskar to you and all your listeners. Whenever Modi comes to North America, he receives a rock star welcome. What are some of the reasons for his popularity here? That's a difficult question to answer because a straightforward answer would be because he has a lot of supporters, the Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP, as it is shortly known, which is underwritten by a very broad organization, the RSS, which is a united network of organizations that stretches across the globe, all provide the infrastructure for Modi's popularity. So to simply say he's popular because the diaspora is more Hindu right-leaning would not be quite accurate. I think one of the reasons for Modi's popularity is, of course, that we have in the United States 5.4 million and growing South Asians living in the diaspora, mostly Indians. And I say South Asia because as we move forward, we should also address the fact that Modi's popularity addresses Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Pakistan. Uh, because there are South Asians who are Hindu from all of those regions as well. So one of the reasons for his popularity is that without a robust relationship with India, the world cannot move forward environmentally, economically, socially, in terms of all kinds of issues. And as you said, the kind of mantra that we use all the time is India is the world's largest democracy. And I would say, yes, it is India's largest democracy, but it is a democracy that's increasingly divided and increasingly verging towards an authoritarianism. So Modi's popularity is buttressed by the number of South Asians we have in the United States about the dissemination of a particular kind of information, what we call in shorthand in South Asia, WhatsApp University, where information and news is disseminated through WhatsApps, where facts are refigured. Social engineering is the sujet du jour. If only people listen to more conversations like this one, I could guarantee you that Modi's popularity would be vastly diminished. But there is no doubt that he is very popular both in India and here. And it's about the way the infrastructure of the BJP and the RSS has constructed this myth 
of Modi as the savior of India, as someone who's going to bring India into the modern future, all of which is currently under enormous siege. You mentioned that he is seen as the leader who's the harbinger of the future. He's projected as someone as a harbinger of the future because he's seen as someone who is modernizing India, its railways, its airports, its economy. And I say those three things because those three things have been under enormous siege. If your listeners have been watching the news, you just saw the disaster in Odisha of the kind of excruciating loss of life which was, of course, largely attributed to the kind of neglect of the central government of India's railway system, which is hugely precarious and vulnerable because it was constructed during the 19th century. And Modi's modernization has focused on building new stations, building new airports, but not on taking care of the structures that still exist. So on the one hand, we have images of new airports, which nobody is flying into as a sign of modernization. And then we have airports where people are standing in lines for five hours to get through immigration, where the services and facilities are awful that we're not thinking about. On the one hand, there is the kind of image of Modi as growing the economy, growing infrastructure. And on the other hand, the reality on the ground is that none of it is true. There is more poverty in India now. There is more death and devastation in India now. Women's rights have eroded. The rights of minorities, particularly if you are a Muslim or a Bahujan or a Dalit, I am Bahujan myself and I am queer. And these are not conditions of safety right now in India. And it is not an exaggeration. Every single day, one lower caste person, particularly a lower caste woman, is either murdered or sexually assaulted. Those are not statistics that one can ignore. So yes, there is the fantasy of modernization, and it can be witnessed in slogans such as Swachh Bharat, which is a phrase that means clean India. One of the challenges for anyone growing up with the global south is, of course, sanitation, clean water, And this I applaud, right? So the ambition is very seductive. Who doesn't want clean India? Who doesn't want a more environmentally sustainable India? But all of that is a facade. You see signs everywhere, but are there more public toilets for women in India? I would say no. Is the environment cleaner? No. So there are all of these kind of slogans, which are very seductive and very appealing. So at this point, you have even economists who have tried to shy away from these conversations as being too political, stepping in and saying, we really need a turnaround. The Indian rupee is at its lowest in relationship to the US dollar than it has been in a very long time. These are not signs of success. So the question for you and me and your listeners is, if we know all this, there is massive information evidence of his failures. So why is he still successful? Why is he still winning? And I think that is because he's created an environment of fear and an environment of precarity in that people who speak up are getting increasingly incarcerated. I have many academic friends who are incarcerated. Artists are unable to speak because the exhibitions are being toned down. Movies are being censored. So if you have an entire environment of surveillance, it's very difficult to push back and say, I dissent. I have the privilege and liberty of saying what I do because I do not live in India anymore, and my parents have passed away. And that is a real fact, because many people who live in the diaspora, like me, who work in South Asia, have to be very careful about what we say, because we can be denied entry back home. And for many years, I was more caged. I was more careful, because I wanted to be able to go home for my research, but also more to see my family. And I I want to remind your listeners that non-action doesn't always mean you don't care. It simply means that we have restrictions to how we participate. And I want to encourage them to think of avenues in which we could participate because Hindutva is not an Indian project. It is now a global project. It is here on our shores. It is in our homes. It is in the books we read. It is in the remanufacturing of Indian history. And it is there in the fact that Joe Biden is applauding Modi for his success in India, when just in 2005, many of us rallied to deny Narendra Modi a a visa precisely for human rights violations. When you talk about the challenges to people speaking out, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation here in Canada spoke to 18 Canadian academics. 
all of them who have spoken out against Modi or Hindu nationalist-led project have been harassed or threatened by those who support Hindu nationalism. And those harassments range from like hundreds of abusive emails to death and rape threats. So I'm glad that you said that. Why is the diaspora so important, do you think, to somebody like Modi? There are three, I would say, three broad reasons. The first reason is material and numerical, meaning, as you said, between Canada and the U.S., there's a substantial diaspora numerically, which cannot be ignored as an electoral project, as a space of remittances, as a space of alliances. The second reason, which to me is the most important one, is almost 20% of Narendra Modi's digital campaign funds came from the diaspora. Now, I don't know how many of your listeners are aware, but one of the kind of strengths of Modi's campaign in the last elections and the elections that are coming up in 2024, which is just around the corner, has been his ability to mobilize a digital platform to get youth involved in his campaign. And it is important to note that when we say Hindutva, we are not talking about people who are out of touch, a certain age group. The alarming feature of the elections has been how many urban youth in India have voted for Narendra Modi. So we've got to think about how is he reaching them, what is important about them, and the material contributions of the diaspora to the political campaigns is super important and cannot be ignored. So I think that's the second reason. The third reason of why the diaspora is important is the global supply chain. What the pandemic did because of the way supply chains broke down and suddenly people realized, oh my God, that little object I bought from Amazon was actually made in India, then moved through China and then got on a ship. These are supply chains that became super visible. And suddenly India and China, which in my mind have always been important players, but have become formidable. So you can no longer do environmental change without them having a buy-in. You can no longer make any inroads into broader political issues. If you think about what's going on in Ukraine, India has remained on the fence for many reasons, which I don't want to bore your listeners with. But it's a very important stance because India's refusal to take a stance makes it very different geopolitically for other actors to weigh in. So there are masses of global factors at play. There are material factors at play. And also because Narendra Modi's multiple visits to the US are evidence of why he needs to garner that kind of popularity because it translates into financial support for his campaign. It's also important to note that his last visits were not state visits. So even though he has been the prime minister for a while, this is the first visit he is making as a representative of a sovereign state. Also important is that we have a vice president who is of South Asian origin, Kamala Harris, who is both black and South Asian, and in the past has made critical comments about Narendra Modi. So it'll be interesting to see as this moves forward, whether she will be pushed on that question further. If it's an official state visit, then she's not allowed to say those. She won't be allowed to say it, but thank God for journalists and media. We have ample evidence where she has made clear statements. I'm sure they will skirt around the issue, but it is important for that to be on the record. At this point, all we can do is record and remind and hope something changes through that process. Because we're talking about the financial support and the the idea of remittances. 23% of remittances that go to India are from the United States. And India is the largest receiver of remittances globally. But legally, the idea of remittances going to political campaigns in India, it's not legal, correct? So I want to distinguish between remittances that are sent for family support, for education, and the different kind of structuring of capital through which money is funneled into the campaign for the BJP. So if you're an overseas citizen of India, like I am, you're allowed to have a bank account, you can have money in a way that someone... I don't know if your listeners, how many know the distinctions, but overseas citizen of India basically gives you most rights except the right to vote. 
And currently there is a petition going on in the Indian diaspora here in the United States for the overseas community to have legal representation in parliament that we should actually have, which is, I doubt whether it'll happen, but it is definitely something that is worth noting. So when you are an overseas citizen of India, there are different capital paths through which you can funnel money. But of course, this is the global south. There are ways of getting resources through both above board and under board. And in South Asia and India, we have a term called jagard. Jagard basically means you adjust, you make do, you figure out a way to make it work. <laughs> and politics right. is jagard, right? And it is both our strength in that we adjust to situations of peril, but it is also a way in which, as anyone who's been to India, why the bureaucracy is such a nightmare, because there's always some jagard. The government is also using this idea of foreign money to monitor organizations like Amnesty International and other nonprofit organizations that no longer have a footprint in India because their foreign resources are being judged as coming from corrupt, influential foreign organizations like the Open Society, which the BJP loves to dump on. Like the BBC, for example, as soon as the documentary about Modi came out, the BBC offices in Delhi were ransacked. And now they're going through a tax evaluation and are being accused of tax fraud. So, of course, there is money, but the question is which money is allowed to go through, which money isn't. And it's significant that organizations that work on human rights are the organizations that are increasingly under peril and can no longer get money from foundations that are based in the global north. You're telling us that part of the reason Modi is so popular, both in India and here, but here in North America is because of this infrastructure that exists and this messaging. So part of that messaging that I understand is this idea, and I think you alluded to it when you talked about the Open Society and the BBC, but this idea that he stands up to like Western bullying or that it's like, finally, we're letting go of our colonial past or any of those kinds of cultural ideas, a lot of people grab onto. And I want to unpack that a tiny bit. That's a terrific question. And in some ways, it's a red herring. Not your question, but that invocation of the West as the corruptive form and the rest as being the kind of vigilant dissenting body. I think one of the things that I'm a historian, so I have to remind viewers of this, is that the rise of Modi is concurrent with the rise of authoritarianism across the world, right? So we can't imagine Modi as an, in isolation. We have, the Philippines now has a different president, but Duterte, who was the president of the Philippines, was just as bad. Bolsonaro in Brazil, the canvas across the world, particularly Imran Khan in South Asia. So this is not a new phenomenon, right? The kind of script to justify the rise of authoritarianism shifts. Yes, for a long time, it was that Modi will, with his nativism, with his vigilant, bellicose, masculine nativism, with his celibate, he's, it's very important that Narendra Modi gave up his wife and has devoted his life to the country. This is all a version of bellicose masculinity that needs a story to make it seem even more seductive. So the idea of standing up, the David and Goliath, standing up to the West is certainly one, but it's not working even for the BJP anymore. And a terrific example of where it's both working and not working is something that is very dear to me, which is the question of same-sex rights. So, for example, the BJP for a very long time, when I say BJP, it's a shorthand for the ruling party. So for the longest time, the BJP was very much against rights and recognition for the LGBTI and growing community. Section 377, which, you know, I have written about a lot, which criminalized same-sex behavior, primarily sodomy, was on the books. And after a lot of back and forth, the law was finally written down. Now, what we learned during that was that the BJP, on the one hand, was very much homosexuality is a Western import. But on the other hand, what they also realized that the world was changing and the Indian demographic was changing. Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was a governor of the wonderful state of California, is a great example. He was socially progressive. I don't know what that means, but basically it means he was down with the queers. But he was a horrible conservative when it came to social policy. So in some ways, I think the BJP had to recycle and refurbish. So you had 
really right-wing, hard, right people from the BJP now suddenly saying homosexuality is part of our culture, if you read our holy texts, etc. So you have to think what happened. Because we have on record, as a queer person growing up in India and having moved here, there was no doubt that there was homophobia in a very dated way. So what happened? What happened is that they realized that if they did not open up their doors to that kind of logic, they would lose money. They would have sanctions. They would appear as economically in peril because corporations are invested in public images as well. You could see what is happening in Uganda right now with the ferocious backlash against homosexuality. And what is the first thing that happens? Companies say, look, we're not going to invest. You have horrific laws. So the BJP understands, I don't think it's because their views change, they understood. But now we are in 2020-23, where the queer community is asking for same-sex marriage. And suddenly the BJP has to pedal back again, because obviously same-sex marriage is less about marriage. It's about the reworking of the family form, right? It's about saying the family is no longer the Hindu family. It's not the heterosexual family. It's different. And that has really put them in a panic and say, look, we're, we're fine with the queers, but you've got to do it in your bedrooms. You can't take it out. So I think this is where the kind of story of the West is awful. We are cleaner, purer, doesn't work because economics intervenes. So I don't think the BJP has actually changed any of his ideas. If we look at the statistics, the violence against queer people, queer youth, trans youth, trans folks has not diminished even though we have more recognition now. So socially, things haven't quite changed that much, even though legally they may have. So I think there's going to be more of this, especially when it comes to women's rights and, of course, the rights of Muslims and lower caste people. It is impossible to be safe as a Muslim in India if you have BJP leaders openly saying in rallies, take out your weapons and go kill Muslims. And this, any one of your listeners can just Google it. It is available freely. This is not censored speech. There's an invitation to go kill, commit murder in the name of Hindutva. So caste and religion continue to be the most divisive, corrosive forces, and the BJP cannot cover them up anymore. And I think this is where we are seeing the slight change. And the recent victory in the state of Karnataka, which is in southern India, is a very important sign because it's a break. The dams have not opened, but there is a break in the kind of story that has worked for so long. And the recent visit of Rahul Gandhi to the United States, who is, of course, the head of the opposition, signaled that kind of victory. Talking about Rahul Gandhi, you recently hosted a discussion in California with the former opposition leader. He was sentenced to two years in jail for comments that he made criticizing Modi. So let's talk about what Rahul Gandhi, who's Indra Gandhi's grandson and the former opposition leader, what was he doing here? Rahul Gandhi just completed a very successful journey, which was called the Bharat Jodo Yatra, which basically would translate to uniting India through walking. But that sounds very unpoetic. The phrase (laughs) is actually much more poetic, but it's about bringing people together through a journey across the country. And of course, this is a very Gandhian, Nehruvian project. And despite much of our suspicion and skepticism, the Bharat Jodo Yatra was a success. He walked from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, which is an enormous length of space over a period of six months. And as a result, talked to people. And of course, his PR machinery did a wonderful job of explaining, of showing us videos. And a lot of people from the left walked with him as well, which is very significant. And I would be one of them. I did not walk with them, but I have had enormous skepticism about Rahul Gandhi as a dynastic figure, as someone who's not equipped to be a politician. And I still have that skepticism. But what I was taken with was a desire to bring out another version of India, which is, of course, for many still something we we remember and we aspire to. The conversation I held with him was focused on justice and democratic futures. And it was a way to get him to theorize, explain to the people in the diaspora who were there about what vision of India can he offer that can rouse, rally, but also that can become a political reality. Unless it translates electorally, nothing of this matters. And I also wanted to hear a little bit more about what he thinks the diaspora can do. 
So as you were saying before, I get about two emails every day for the last, I would say, three years from some RSS supporter about my being a traitor to the Indian nation, about about murdering and raping me and my family, etc. And also invitations to join their party, to start student organizations. But I have as yet never received anything from the Congress. I don't mean the bad stuff, but even an invitation. So there's a complete lack of organization. They do not have the infrastructure that the BJP has here. And I think this was a recognition because he has a lot of young people in India, 50s is young. So I am a young person, a lot of young people who are managing him right now. And I think that was an effort to do that. I don't know how much difference it will make, but there is certainly a lot of goodwill that he has right now on his credit because of this Jodo Yatra. I mean, it's just a vision of India, which we have been dying to see which is where Muslims, Dalits, queer people, trans people are walking together. And I know it sounds like a terrible old-fashioned Benetton ad, but for many of us, the sad part is Indian politics is full of criminals and rapists and awful people. So Rahul Gandhi, despite his dynastic origins, besides his upper-class access, provided a sliver of possibility. When is the last time you heard an Indian politician speak about love? And again, I have to underscore that I remain enormously skeptical. But what I was taken by was when I asked him, I said, what will you do if an RSS man comes up to you during the Yatra? What did you do? And he said, I looked at him and I said, which in Hindi means I love you. And he said, I did it because I wanted to disarm him with the fact that I wasn't going to respond hate with hate. Now, again, all of this sounds wonderful for now, but it will not guarantee, or in fact, I don't think the BJP will lose in 2024, but at least we're seeing some signs of oppositional unity, which we haven't for a while. So that's where I feel like Rahul Gandhi is not the solution at all, but at least he offers up a possibility of another version of India, which we are so desperate to see. In some ways, you're saying that this is the beginning of the understanding that the South Asian diaspora does and could have some impact on politics. The diaspora has been super active for a long time, and oftentimes we forget. So Rahul Gandhi's visit is great, but I feel like we have been organizing, particularly around caste discrimination, which has been an issue, for example, the Toronto School District. Caste discrimination was recognized as a protected category by the California Senate, which are enormous. And this happened because young people in the diaspora understand inequality to be not a place of possibility. And for your listeners who don't know what caste is or need a better understanding of caste, I will quote Dr. Baba Saib Ambedkar, who is the person who wrote the constitution, Indian constitution, and was important for galvanizing lower caste people who we refer to as Dalit. Dr. Ambedkar described caste as both the segregation of labor and the segregation of laborers meaning that caste is a system of social stratification. It's a hierarchy that creates a difference, not in terms of the work that people do, but also in terms of how people are regarded. So, for example, manual scavenging, which is not something we see in the United States, is still undertaken 80% by people from lower caste, that people who take out your sh- and throw it away with their hands, who go into drain holes and clean them out with their hands. These are communities that continue to service, and they are usually the most caste-oppressed communities. But I want to signal our strengths. In the diaspora, the kind of global expansion of awareness around questions of caste. So, for example, Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote this book called Caste and Its Discontents, it was less about India, but mainly about a moment in which black history and and anti-caste history converges in their understanding of difference and hierarchy as this very kind of strangleholding place that needs to be taken down. So I think it's important to think about the South Asian diaspora as being energetic, complex, multilingual, multi-regional, and multi-generational. And I think that's the most exciting thing for me right now. I look around and I see a lot of people who are invested in thinking about how do we end inequality. And Modi represents the worst avatar of inequality that we have. And I think people care about that. 
the globalization of queerness, which has its problems, has also had its strengths in that people who are speaking from one part of India where perhaps there is no other queer, people can reach out to someone here in the United States, whether it's through internet or social platforms, etc. So I think the diaspora is not a unified thing. It never was. It's not like suddenly we're ready to fight and we weren't. We've always been ready to fight. But I think economics, our settlement, our awareness, the presence of people like you and me, more brown faces in the media, in politics, in activism has changed things, right? And we have South Asian progressive politicians and we have South Asian awful politicians like Nikki Haley, who is running for president, right? So it's good. There is diversity. We need diversity so we can't be pigeonholed. So I think this is a moment of great possibility for us. And I think the fact that we wield electoral influence both here and in India matters. In what I read so much about in mainstream media anyways, is that Modi's been called India's Trump and that there are a lot of South Asians in the diaspora that supported Trump and continue, you mentioned Nikki Haley, and continue to support some of his legacy ideas. But what do you think about that, this idea of the Trump impact on Hindus for Trump and this idea of the comparison of Hindutva to America's far right? I think the comparison is valid, but I think the comparison should be reversed. I would say it's the Modi impact on Trump. The comparison is apt, but it is also skewed, again, by questions of caste, right? The kind of infrastructure of right-wing organization in the United States is organized around immigration, around race, around gender, in a very different way than it is organized in South Asia and in India in particular, where questions of communalism and caste make a big difference. So for example, even though Trump probably thought it, he never actually said Muslims need to be killed. Modi's army can say Muslims need to be killed or love jihad. Muslim men are going out and recruiting Hindu women so that they can breed more Muslims. So there is, I think the scale of the right-wing craziness needs to be understood. I could never say any of this in India right now without being aware of the consequences that I could experience. Whereas in the United States, the scale is vastly different. And this is the one thing I would invite your listeners to really meditate on. That yes, we see violence. We are seeing awful stuff happening in North America. And it is not to say that the North America is a bastion of human rights. It is not. Canada has a lot of problems. We'll need another talk show for that. But in India, the scale is very different because of the economic disparity and the access people have to rights and representation. Thank you so much, Anjali. It was really wonderful to speak with you. It was my pleasure, and I look forward to many more conversations. That's it for this episode of Don't Call Me Resilient. I don't know about you, but I learned so much about the South Asian diaspora and Indian politics from Anjali. If you want to read more about some of the issues we talked about today, I've dropped some links in the show notes on theconversation.com. Come find us on Instagram at Don't Call Me Resilient Podcast, or find me on Twitter at Write Vinita. That's W-R-I-T-E-V-I-N-I-T-A. If you like what you heard today, great news, because we'll be back next week. In the meantime, make sure to follow the podcast so you don't miss an episode. And please consider sharing this pod with a friend or a family member, or drop a review on whatever podcast app you use. Finally, if you have ideas about news stories that you'd love to hear us cover, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at dcmr at theconversation.com. Don't Call Me Resilient is a production of The Conversation Canada. This podcast was produced in partnership with the Journalism Innovation Lab. The lab is funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The series is produced and hosted by me, Vinita Srivastava. Boke Saisi is our producer. Ali Nicholas is our assistant producer and student journalist. Jennifer Moroz is our consulting producer. Our audio editor is Ramatula Sheikh. Atika Kaki is our audience development and visual innovation consultant. And Scott White 
is the CEO of The Conversation Canada. And if you're wondering who wrote and performed the music we use on the pod, that's the amazing Zaki Ibrahim. The track is called Something in the Water. Maybe.